What's fascinating when you look into the history is um, so-called investment um, products that, that we think of as, as fairly recent, like derivative uh, products, have actually been around for, for centuries. Uh, futures contracts go back to 2400 uh, BCE uh, in, in various forms. Uh, call options go back to 600 uh, BCE at least. Um, in the 18th century BCE, there uh, not only were there personal loans, uh, but there was a, a, a liquid secondary market for these promissory notes. So it, it's fascinating um, looking at um, what we think as, as new inventions are, are very old. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone and welcome to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged where today I'm joined by Steve Forrester who's a finance professor at Ivy Business School at Western University and the co-author along with one of my previous guests namely Professor Andrew Lowe of a great new book called In Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio which by the way is a great title. So first off Steve thanks so much for joining me today. I have looked forward to our conversation. How are you doing? How are things where you are in the world? I'm doing great and uh, really appreciate um, being here and chatting with you. Absolutely. Now, I mentioned that you wrote this highly recommended book together with Andrew Lowe. So perhaps we start out with you sharing a bit of the backstory as to how you got to become a professor in finance, how you met Andrew Lowe, and what was the inspiration to writing uh, this book together? Of course, that is three questions in one. So uh, I'll remind you if some some of us forget uh, along the way. Certainly. So uh, I've actually come full circle. I did my undergrad uh, in business at the Ivy Business School and enjoyed that experience and had an opportunity to teach um, at Ivy for a couple of years just on a contract basis. And I really enjoyed that and so decided to see if I could make a profession had to choose a, a discipline, and uh, I enjoyed finance, um, and so that's what I chose and decided to get a PhD and tried to see what would be the best uh, school that would take me, and it turned out I was fortunate enough uh, to be accepted to, to uh, the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania, and uh, that's where I met uh, a young, younger than me, um, bright new professor who had uh, just graduated uh, with a PhD from Harvard at, at the ripe old age of, I think it was 24. And he was teaching his first uh, PhD course um, that I had the pleasure of being in. And of course, that was uh, Andrew Lowe. So that's how we, uh, that's how we met. Uh, that's the, the backstory of, of that. We, we stayed in touch and uh, Gosh, it was almost 10 years ago that uh, I reached out to him with this idea of, of uh, writing a book. I didn't have much in mind except for this, this title, which is In Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio. Yeah, which is a great one, yeah. And invited him to see whether uh, he might uh, be on board, and, and he immediately said yes. And uh, so everything fell into place after that, and we just kept adding luminaries that uh, that that we thought uh, would be engaging both in the academic world and and beyond and what really helped was starting with Harry Markowitz um, and everything I think leads back to Harry Markowitz and so once he was on board uh, others got on board as well and um, that's the story and so did you manage to do interviews with uh, most of these people that you've 
Yes, oh. yes. So that was, uh, the, the, I, I often felt like a kid in a candy store um, actually right. meeting these uh, these heroes that, uh, that, of course, we had read about and, and having the opportunity to, uh, to, to talk with them. Uh, we actually uh, decided to um, make video recordings. And so these are all available on our, uh, on our book website. Uh, there are links to it. Um, so um, that's, uh, that, that was a real treat to, to meet and, and interview all of them. And just so I don't forget, do you know the 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 URL or, or where people can go to watch these? Or, yes. It's, otherwise, I'll uh, put it in the show notes if you if you don't. It's it's the book title. It's not a short one, but it's the book title: "In Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio." All one word. dot com. Um, so that's uh, where it's at. Okay. Well, I'll definitely go go and check that out. Now, the book is a tribute in some ways to the academics who created a framework and repeatable process for investors, and as you call it, a democratization of investment management. And before we get into who these characters are, perhaps you can talk about some of the concepts of this framework and explain why it is so crucial to how we invest today. Sure. Um, I I think the most important concept is is the one of diversification, and uh, when we talk about Harry Markowitz, we can get into that in in more detail. Um, but that's where the framework for the whole portfolio management industry really uh, really um, goes back to. And we've got these two components: obviously, expected return and and risk. And and I think really um, uh, the luminaries have. Uh, really helped us to understand the the different uh, the different elements that go into thinking about risk. So that's an important concept um, that uh, that uh, is is part of this book as as well. Another concept and I uh, and theme that I think uh, recurs throughout uh, the book is uh, is the importance of of cost. And and I know you're very well aware and and in your in your fund are very aware of keeping costs low for investors. Um, and that comes out uh, time and time again. And I would say that the last uh, theme and, and concept has to do with what we call now behavioral economics, uh, trying to avoid mistakes. Uh, we all make them, we're all prone to various biases. So the first step, I think, is really an awareness of these uh, biases and then trying to overcome them. So these are some of the some of the key concepts and some of the key themes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, early on in the book, you show this wonderful kind of organizational chart of the characters in your book and how they are all linked to each other in some way. And I have to say, it's quite amazing to see how closely they were linked or are still linked is this how the academics tend to uh, work and how it all evolves? <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. Very few um, degrees of freedom uh, among the uh, the luminaries, uh, in particular the academics, but even across uh, the the academics uh, and the practitioners, there are many uh, many connections. Um, I, I'm not sure how how typical this this might be, but it, it is fascinating just in terms of looking at. Um, who uh, who was a supervisor uh, of uh, of someone else's PhD uh, committee, and and it's it's funny uh, there there are actually uh, a spinoff of that is is you can uh, create some uh, some ancestry charts of who your uh, PhD supervisor is and who was their PhD uh, supervisor. So for example. My grandfather, in terms of supervisors, is Gene Fama, one of the uh, one of the luminaries that oh, we're going wow. to talk about. So, it, there are a lot of interconnections uh, that way. Yeah, no, I mean that's uh, it's fascinating. Now, you start out by giving a historical account of the history of investments, and unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all of that. But if you were to highlight one or two sort of pivotal things that happened that helped shape the world of investments as we know it today. What, what would you say that has been? Well, I, I think uh, what, what's fascinating when you look into the history is um, so-called 
investment um, products that that we think of as as fairly recent, like derivative uh, products, have actually been around for for centuries. Uh, futures contracts go back to 2400 uh, BCE uh, in in various forms. Uh, call options go back to 600 uh, BCE at least. Um, in the 18th century BCE. There, uh, not only were there personal loans, uh, but there was a, a, a liquid secondary market for these promissory notes. So it, it, it's fascinating um, looking at um, what we think as, as new inventions are, are very old. Government bonds, the precursor to government bonds, a lot of these things, what, what's interesting as well, uh, just... Uh, um, happened um, not by intent, but out of necessity. Um, and the first uh, a precursor to government bonds uh, dates back to uh, Venice in 1172, um, where um, there was uh, a need to uh, raise some funds to, uh, to fight a war, um, which didn't turn out very well for the Venetians, uh, but uh, had this uh, lasting legacy. So all kinds of uh, all kinds of interesting historical facts. Uh, one more that I'll I'll just share uh, when we uh, when we think of uh, mutual funds. Uh, this goes back to uh, the 1700s, um, and the second mutual fund that 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 was created is really a uh, value investing fund. Uh, that was its uh, that's what was its mandate uh, to uh, look for stocks that could be purchased below their intrinsic value. So um, interesting milestones um, when we look at the history. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's fascinating. Now, I want to shift gear and focus more on some of these characters in uh, your book, which starts with a much celebrated economist and Nobel Prize winner called Harry Markowitz. But before we do so, I wanted to ask you about an early 20th century French mathematician who died in obscurity, but whose work on the random walk of stocks was pretty groundbreaking. And his name was Louis Bachelier, and he was born, I think, in 1870. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about that, because I think this is something that I think a lot of people probably is not aware of. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, he uh, he was a, a French postgraduate student. Um, and it was in 1900, actually, that he successfully defended his dissertation called The Theory of, of Speculation. And, and really what he was proposing, and, and this uh, predated uh, Einstein by a few years, was uh, a model of uh, a Brownian motion that um, was explaining um, the randomness of, uh, of security prices. And and so this was really uh, pathbreaking, and unfortunately uh, for Louis, in his time, uh, he didn't get the recognition that, that that he deserved. His committee passed him, but but not with flying colors, and so he had a, a difficult time uh, landing uh, any prestigious academic job. And and it wasn't until basically a half century later where. Um, well-known University of, of Chicago mathematician uh, Jimmy Savage uh, rediscovered uh, his his work, translated into English, brought it to the attention of uh, future Nobel Prize winner Paul Samuelson, and that really uh, gave it the attention that that it deserved. So he was incredibly ahead of his uh, ahead of his time, and fortunately, um, although not in his life. Uh, got the credit that he deserved. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. But now let's get back to, um, as you also pointed out, one of the really main characters. Um, and by the way, I should say that the book has a lot more people uh, in it than than we're going to have time for today. But I wanted to start out with Harry Markovich, as you said, born in Chicago in 1927. And um, many people know, of course, him for the article Portfolio Selection, which he published in 1952. So tell us about his story, so to speak. Yeah, so Harry Markowitz, a fascinating individual. And I think uh, I think a few months ago, I think he just turned 94. Uh, we met with him and, and interviewed him uh, a few years ago. Uh, he was still active uh, writing, I think, the 
third of, of four planned volumes uh, of, of, of a book, um, still still teaching. Um, he really, uh, what's fascinating is is he he really had a, a background in operations research, and he stumbled into uh, the whole investment world. And uh, the story that we tell, it's been been told before, is that uh, as many struggling PhD students can relate to, um, he had gone through his coursework and he was struggling to find a topic for his dissertation. And so he went to see his, uh, his supervisor and his supervisor was busy. So he was, uh, Harry was waiting in the uh, ante room and another gentleman was waiting there as well. And they struck up a conversation Turns out this uh, this gentleman was a stockbroker, and so while they were talking, um, that gave Harry some ideas. And when he went in to see his, see his supervisor, uh, Harry said, "Well, this this guy out in the in the hallway, he's a stockbroker, and he thinks I should should do a dissertation on on uh, on stocks. What do you think?" And uh, Harry Markowitz calls it uh, the best advice he uh, ever received from a from a stockbroker. So that's uh, that was uh, that was how he sort of stumbled stumbled into it. The other fascinating event, the the real aha moment, Markowitz was then given uh, a reading list since he wasn't familiar with uh, with the investment literature, which of course was was much less developed than it is today, but there, there were some, uh, some classic books um, that, uh, that Markowitz was, was asked uh, to, to read. And, and one of the books um, that, that, as Harry was reading it, um, talked about how one should make investment decisions. Um, and it really focused on looking at the expected return of a security. And, and what bothered Markowitz is that um, if that was the case, then um, one would end up with a portfolio of putting all of your money in the one security that had the highest expected return. And, and that didn't seem to make sense. And, and so this is where, where Markowitz certainly was, was aware, and others were at, at the time, of, of the whole premise of not putting all of your eggs in, in one basket. And so he, he started to think of, of what must be missing. And so he pulled out a, a book on, uh, on probability theory, and his aha moment uh, was coming across what, what is now familiar, familiar to anyone who's taken an investments course in the portfolio management course, which was a, a formula for the variance of a uh, portfolio. Um, and, and think of a, two, a very simple two-stock portfolio, which has um, a, a variance, uh, a couple of variance terms, but it also has this covariance term, which incorporates the correlation. And so the aha moment was that, um, yes, expected returns are important. Yes, risk as measured by volatility of returns, standard deviation variance, that's important. But also the missing link was that correlations are critical as well. And in fact, as we know, the more securities that that you put into a portfolio. It's those correlations or that, that covariance component that, that really dominates. And, and so that's where uh, he was able to take these concepts and create what we now call uh, an efficient frontier. And, and basically, if we think of, of in risk return space, the efficient frontier shows us the combination of individual securities, in other words, shows us the portfolios that have the important property of the highest expected return for a given level of risk or the lowest level of risk for a given level of expected return. And, and so that's really the focus of, as you mentioned, his 1952 portfolio selection uh, journal of finance that, that really was the start of, uh, of a whole industry. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, it, to me again, when, when I read the book, um, I think it's, it's difficult not to stress the importance of 
how different he was thinking at the time. Because you were right. I think a lot of people back then were thinking about, yeah, we'll put we'll put everything into sort of one basket and we'll watch the basket really carefully. Mm-hmm. And here he comes along and says, no, 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 actually, <laughs> that's not what you need to do. So it, 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 we don't think of that as revolutionary today, but it, it would have been massively uh, different from how the general a- academics were thinking back then. And I think that's quite interesting. The paper itself was just so different than than other papers, right? Yeah, even that that were published in the in the uh, distinguished journal of journal of finance at the time. Most would have been, in fact, the vast majority, if if not almost all, would have been qualitative in in nature, and and so his was uh, what, what's unique uh, relative today. His was solo authored, uh, had a very few references. And it had lots of lots of equations, um, and, uh, and and so that's uh, that's what really made it uh, different. Uh, but but he was able to put put these concepts and and come up with this uh, framework that uh, we still rely on today. Yeah. Now he published the article in fifty two, but that's not when he got his PhD, right? Correct. He got it. Uh, Three years later, uh, in later. 1955. Yeah. So this would have been a, a, a portion of it. Um, and by the way, that's something unique as as well to be published uh, even before you have your dissertation. And was there some con- uh, uh, controversy about him getting his uh, PhD? That I just seem to remember from the book that uh, he felt pretty sure that he could go in and defend it. Um, but then when they came out, they weren't that... Uh, Excited. So on his uh, on his committee uh, was future Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman. So Harry was very confident going in. He knew the material. Um, he tried to anticipate what kind of questions would come up, and and so he felt very confident until in in the first five minutes, Milton Friedman Friedman says, uh, "Well, Harry, uh, taking a look at your your math and and everything's fine, but." Um, you are here for a PhD in economics, and and this isn't economics. Um, no, this is this is mathematics, and so I think there was a debate among the committee members, and whether this was really a, a showstopper or or not. It certainly gave uh, gave uh, Markowitz uh, some uh, some anxious uh, anxious moments, and and it really speaks to uh, how much of a trailblazer Markowitz was, and this whole area really creating. This this new branch of economics, uh, finance and and investments more specifically, um, that 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 speaks to uh, the importance of his work. Yeah, and I guess in in some ways now clearly you know certainly on 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 my side coming from the quantitative side of 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 investing, I mean this probably is the birth of quantitative investing as as we know it, uh, or, or were there others that kind of. Uh, at that early stage, already had ventured into this. I think this is uh, this is the first. Uh, it, well, interestingly, th- there were some there were some others outside of, of finance, who uh, and and this came to light I think later, were grappling with similar types of concepts, but in a different context. Um, for example, there was a paper in 1952 by a fellow named Roy that was in an insurance context and it was very mathematical as as well and in retrospect had same some of the same properties of markowitz's efficient frontier um so in other disciplines there were some quantitative models being created but but this would have to be uh, i think one of the first uh, in in finance with the exception of uh, uh, Louis Bachelet that we talked about earlier, that course, unfortunately yeah. didn't get the prominence uh, that it deserved. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, you know, what I thought could be fun uh, also is um, before we leave Markovic and before we leave the others that that we decided to talk about today, is maybe for you to kind of try and summarize for each of them. So in this case, Markovic, what in in his opinion is or, or was the the perfect portfolio, so to speak. So, so clearly for Markowitz, it's uh, a diversified portfolio, um, diversifying uh, across uh, not only stocks but across bonds as as well. 
Um, what's what's fascinating? What we what we found is that um, unlike Bill Sharp, who we'll, we'll talk about uh, in a little while, Markowitz didn't seem to put any particular prominence on what we refer to now as the market portfolio. So I think going back to Markowitz's efficient frontier, it's important to be diversified and it's important to have a portfolio of securities. I I think the key takeaway is um, whether or not we are perfectly on this efficient frontier is less important than getting close to this efficient frontier. So thinking of uh, thinking of a diversified uh, mix, but whether it's the market or not, there's nothing wrong with with having uh, a market portfolio, but so long as you're diversified. And so really that was his key takeaway in terms of how he sees the perfect portfolio. The other thing that that he would also want to emphasize is is that we should always be uh, be taking into account any new information. So he would refer to himself uh, as a, a diehard Bayesian. If there's new information, then update your your beliefs. And so that's an important part of this as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. You mentioned Bill Sharp or William Sharp. Um, and um, let's continue the story because Markovich meets uh, Bill Sharp when they both work at RAND, which is a think, think tank in California. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, uh, Bill Sharp is a very important, another very important mm-hmm. person in the history of finance. So, so tell tell us about uh, Bill Sharp. Um, so, Bill, Bill Sharp again, a uh, very interesting individual. He, uh, on, on many occasions, uh, is a great example of resilience and overcoming setbacks. And and these setbacks go go all the way back to uh, grade four. Bill Sharp actually failed grade four, and the reason he failed grade four was because of one math test. And these were in the days when uh, you had to know your times tables. And so Bill Sharp had studied his times table up to 10 times 10. But unfortunately, it turned out the test was going all the way up to 12 times 12. And because of that, if you can believe it, Bill Sharp uh, failed grade four and had to repeat (laughs) grade four. Um, That's a great story, yeah. Fast forward to to uh, Bill Sharp then embarking on his uh, PhD thesis. He found what he thought was a fascinating topic on which to do a, a dissertation, and had done all kinds of work at, and figured he was about halfway there. And the topic was transfer pricing. So he was asked to to talk to one of the local experts on on this area of research. Um, And when he shared his progress, um, the expert came back and said, I'm sorry, but but this really really is not promising for a thesis and it's best you just leave it and start somewhere else. So Sharp was devastated. And and the good news for us uh, in this profession, of course, is that um, Sharp's supervisor said, well, remember this, this fellow, Harry Markowitz, who, who gave a seminar talk um, at, uh, at, at UCLA? Um, he's, at, he's at RAND now, and uh, you, know, you, should go, you should go talk to him. And so that's how the two of them met. And uh, it was really Sharp then picking up on, on the work of, uh, of Harry Markowitz that led to both of them being uh, co-recipients of the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, in 1990. So that's a bit of the backstory there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think also from reading your book, um, there was this funny thing that actually uh, another th- sort of coincidental thing. I think originally Sharp was meant to become a medical yes. student or he was studying medicine initially, but he didn't like blood. So he <laughs> kind of changed the subject. That's absolutely right, and and in fact, uh, one of the other luminaries that that we have time to talk about uh, today, uh, but uh, Bob Schiller, he was debating between medicine and economics, and and chose economics. So uh, I think we're we're, we're fortunate that uh, where these individuals ended up. Yeah. So he he joins Rand in 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 1956, uh, as far as I recall, 
And um, and of course, as you said, it's kind of the beginning of a a long working relationship between him and 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 Markovic. Tell tell me a little bit more about some of the things that they started working on. Of course, some of the things that that I seem to remember that um, is important today. I think, even though may, many people may not uh, think about it in this way, is that Sharp kind of coined the phrase or the concept of beta. Mm-hmm when he was trying to simplify Mark, which is model and referred it to the market portfolio. But he, for example, never, he, as far as I know, he never talked about kind of index funds as far as I can tell. But of course, this was uh, very instrumental in also the whole passive investment revolution mm-hmm. that happened uh, as well. So a lot of things kind of started growing uh, or the seeds were laid for things that, that came later. So, you can go anywhere sure. with this, but there is so much to there, to dig into with these people. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see if I can unpack uh, a, a number of these <laughs> uh, these, these uh, great directions that you've given me. So at at Rand, so Markowitz had completed his uh, his uh, dissertation, and we know this 1952 paper that that, that you mentioned on uh, right. called portfolio selection. In the next uh, in the next six or seven years, um, what Markowitz did was was worked on on the same area, and going into more depth in terms of uh, in in terms of the various concepts, and that led to a book by the same title, Portfolio Selection, that came out of the Rand Corporation as a monograph in 1959. So it was around this time that. When Sharp met uh, met met Markowitz, um, that he was developing these various concepts, and in uh, in one of the chapters, and, and I believe it was actually a, a footnote, Markowitz talked about um, a way of extending his model, his efficient frontier. So, if your listeners can can imagine this efficient frontier, um, which is in this expect a return and, and risk space. And, and has this uh, concave shape to it. The insight that, that, that Sharp picked up on was what happens to this model if we add one more security? And that security is a riskless security. So now we're choosing between a riskless security and choosing among all of the portfolios of risky securities on this efficient frontier that um, Markowitz uh, created. And, and so it turns out, if you can picture this visually, imagine then just simply drawing a straight line to the tangency of the efficient frontier. That turns out to be the optimal portfolio of risky assets is on that tangent because it's closest to this northwest corner of lowest risk for the highest amount of expected return. Mm. And and so the magic in that is that in this world, in this with this model, everybody should choose that one particular um, portfolio. Call it M. Call it the market portfolio. That's your risky asset. Right. And then you you take a proportion of your assets and, and put them in that, and and then you uh, put the other proportion in uh, risk free uh, investments. And so you can go up and down that that curve depending on your, your preference for risk. So it was really sharp that, that was digging down and, and focusing and then trying to model and come up with an equilibrium model that would then tell us, okay, if, if everyone is choosing this market portfolio, how do, how do we price each individual stock? And that's where this magical concept of beta comes into play. All that mattered, and this goes back to, to correlations and co- covariances, All that matters is how each stock varies relative to the market. And so that simplifies things because we don't have to worry about how does uh, Tesla, uh, how does its uh, stock return correlate with Alphabet and how do each of those correlate with Microsoft? We can simply look at each individual stock and how does it vary relative to the market? And that's what beta is 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 all about and that's the backbone of the of the capital asset pricing model yeah which an interesting sidebar um to this 
before coming up with this formal model, Bill Sharp um, published a paper that really was the precursor to this whole notion of index funds. And, and it was simply coming up with an ad hoc model, looking at what we now call beta and how each stock uh, uh, varies relative to the market. But the reason, the motivation for that paper was based on computing cost at the time. It was much less costly to run uh, and, and much faster to run uh, a program that uh, tries to incorporate uh, correlations to the market rather than much more numerous uh, covariances across all these securities. So that was really the, the driver behind the innovation of what we now call beta. Yeah, no, fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. And is Sharp the first one of these sort of uh, uh, luminaries, as you call them, that started really using computer in his work sort of as, as a main driver of these things, is that fair? To yeah, say? I, I believe that's 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 fair to say. And and uh, in fact, we uh, on our on our website uh, for the the really inquisitive readers, we, we actually have posted uh, Bill Sharp's dissertation, and it's a it's fascinating just to even flip through it to see um, how much of, of quantitative modeling he was doing. And you know, nowadays when we think about AI, really what's built into that is, is what I would call sort of a primitive AI because he had looked at how were, were actual um, professional investors, how were they making their decisions? And, and he tried to sort of model, model that. Um, and so it's a fascinating, uh, it's worth just skimming just to, to see how he was building out these uh, quantitative models and then creating what we now call the capital asset pricing model. Yeah, yeah. And I can't help wondering how different would finance be today if they hadn't started using computers back then, right? I mean, they wouldn't have come up with the same things that we, we look at today. So it's kind of, did the theory come or did the computers <laughs> change things so that the theory came? I mean, yeah, Absolutely. chicken and egg kind of situation. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and Sharp was, by, by the way, back in the days of, uh, of punch cards, cards, which many of your Listeners might not be familiar with, but um, you had to uh, type out using a, a particular machine. You'd have to type out your code, which would go into a batch of cards that then uh, a, a large mainframe computer would be reading these programs and executing these, these programs. So um, Sharp uh, mused that uh, if he wasn't successful in his dissertation, he would at least uh, be able to fall back on being a punch card reader. Um, and that was his fallback position. Yeah. I mean, as a fun side note to that, when you mentioned punch cards, I actually work, my day job is uh, is actually, I work for one of the oldest systematic uh, managers in the world. We've been around for 47 years just this past month. And, and actually our founder and his son, the way they started out was to go to the local library every night to run the system, so to speak, a uh, trend following system using punch cards that's so so we have those in 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 our in our offices uh in in the US so uh yeah no absolutely I kind of want to interact a little bit on on uh, and asking you kind of a personal view as well other than just describing these people and then we'll come back to the sharp ratio because we can't leave that out when we have uh, when we talk about bill sharp but i mentioned just briefly that this kind of was some of the the beginnings to the in, in you know active and, and passive type of investment and of course in this case the passive investment uh, revolution as as a professor of finance what do you i'm just curious what do you make of this debate and Given this, because you obviously, I think, also touch on 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 Vanguard and so on and so forth, which we won't have time to today. But there has been, and 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 some of the guests have been on 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 the podcast, like Mike Green, talking about the the challenges we have. But from where you sit, what is your view on on this debate? And and um, is it is it all good? Is it some good? But maybe we're getting to a point where there are some real risks in in because of the amounts being managed in passive uh, forms so certainly if if we if we take a narrow perspective in terms of, uh, of of models like the capital asset pricing model what 
the implication is is that uh, passive is the way to go. And if we look at Bill Sharp's perfect portfolio, he's a, a passive investor in terms of, of stocks and, and bonds. And, and I think if, if we were to go back, you know, 15, 20 years ago from, from a, a consensus among academics would be uh, passive is absolutely the way to go. But uh, as, you're, as you're well aware, since then we've had this emergence of, and a better appreciation of all the behavioral biases that we alluded to earlier, which then uh, I think leaves the door open um, for firms uh, that um, like yours that, that can try to take advantage of, of perhaps perceived uh, inefficiencies. And so I think that's where, where there's an appreciation that there is a, a room for, uh, for active investing. For non-professionals, um, my personal view is the best starting point is to, is to start uh, passively, start with an index fund. Even Warren Buffett um, talks about index funds um, as, as a way to go for, for many investors. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Now, of course, most people know Sharp from the Sharp ratio. So this is kind of the origins of thinking about risk in terms of volatility. So I'm curious maybe for you to put a little bit of, of, of a few words to that. And then I have a follow-up question about volatility and, and the role or the changing role of volatility. But but do you want to put a few words into the, the breakthrough of the, the Sharp ratio, sure. so to speak? So the, the well-known Sharpe ratio um, has as its its numerator the return on uh, a particular investment or a particular asset above the risk-free rate relative to its volatility or risk as uh, as measured by the standard deviation of the returns. And, and so again, going back to if we can visualize this efficient frontier and this uh, this tangency line. Um, between a risk-free rate and uh, and the efficient frontier, basically the the sharp ratio is is describing this uh, the slope that we that we have here. So our objective as uh, as investors is to try to maximize that we we'll call it excess return return above the risk-free rate relative to the amount of risk that we're taking on. So it gives a nice metric uh, return per unit of, uh, of risk. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's certainly a lot of debate in, in, in my world uh, about how good a measure the sharp ratio is because it's been taken a little bit out of, out of context, meaning I think he intended it to be a portfolio-wide measure. But nowadays, we look at it on every single little investment strategy we can find. So the individual components and 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 that might create some problems, but that's actually not where I want to go with my next question, because and and again I'm I'm curious about your your personal opinion here. So volatility is something that when you when you look at the history, uh, kind of gets invented to look at riskiness or it's a measure of riskiness in a portfolio. But as we know today, and the world of finance has become very very um, quantitative and very much driven by quote-unquote algorithms and so on and so forth. And volatility is really a integral part of a lot of these formulas that we all use, especially when it comes to position sizing and so on and so forth. What do you think of this transition from measure to ingredient in, in, in the models? I mean, does this present some unintended risks in your opinion or...? Yeah, no, that's a that's a fascinating question. Um, if we go back to Markowitz, and and this is where really the we, we start with, we need some kind of uh, starting point to, to make these models practical, and and so uh, by assuming that 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 uh, we can capture volatility by something like the standard deviation, then we can make some traction with these with these models. Now, Markowitz did not say this, and I think he, he would emphasize this, that he did not make the assumption that, that stock returns are normally distributed. Right. Um, and, and so this is, I think, where we, where we get into some misinterpretations. However, there are some assumptions in terms of the utility functions that would, that, that would be consistent with a, a, uh, a, return, a, a risk measure using standard deviation. 
I think what we have what we have seen is is that if we think of standard deviation as a risk measure, it it, it is a great first approximation, but it certainly doesn't capture the tail risk. And, and that's where uh, we saw that during the financial crisis, for example. We saw uh, during the beginning of the pandemic where we had these incredible uh, extreme returns that, that are not consistent with the normal distribution. This has, I think, caused us to really rethink uh, ways of measuring um, and thinking about risk. And again, we won't have time to talk about Myron Scholes, but he's a big proponent about thinking about the the, the tails, both the, the 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 lower tail and the upper tail as as well. Yeah, no, no, absolutely appreciate that. Now you mentioned before uh, what you uh, what you would say uh, Bill Sharp would choose as as his perfect portfolio. Um, so I wanted to maybe ask a slightly different question, and that is, what do you think if you had to choose? What do you think? is going to be the main legacy that he's going to be known for because there's quite a few things to choose from. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the capital asset pricing model for for Sharp it's been criticized and and uh, if we have a chance to talk about uh, Gene Fama next uh, sure that's partly where some of the criticism has has come from but I think really laying the foundation for passive investing uh, is his uh, lasting contribution that uh, Jack Bogle and, and at Vanguard and, and others uh, picked up on and, and really created this this index uh, revolution. I think that's where uh, it can go back to uh, Bill Sharp's contributions. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so let's uh, shift gear again because in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, we have this guy called Mac McGowan, I think he was called, who was essentially given a carte blanche by Wells Fargo to, Fargo to hire anybody who wanted to do some really interesting stuff and pay them whatever they needed. And at various times, you had Eugene Farmer, Bill Sharp, Harry Markovich, Myron Scholes, Fisher Black working there. So I, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we're going to spend some time now talking about Eugene Farmer um, because that is another really interesting and important um, character. So I just want to, yeah, why don't you start from, from the beginning, so to speak? Sure. So, so Fama Fama is an interesting individual. Um, really had aspirations to be uh, a, a high school gym teacher. That's what he. Okay. That's what he wanted to be. He was very. He was very athletic. Um, if you have met Bill Sharp, he's he's not uh, he's not a tall individual. Maybe maybe five eight, but actually excelled at uh, at high jumping. Um, when he was young, uh, football was another sport that uh, that that he played. He had a uh, he had a summer job um, working at um, at um, an investment firm where the job was to try to predict uh, what stocks were going to be doing well, and and so he did some primitive modeling and. Uh, of course, as as you know and uh, your colleagues know, uh, you've probably never seen uh, a back test that uh, that you don't like. Uh, they're a great back test. Exactly. But but what he found uh, after finding these these great relationships is nothing worked uh, going going forward. And and so um, when he was doing his dissertation at uh, at University of, of Chicago, that's where he started to focus his attention. He uh, his major contributions have been empirical, and uh, this was also uh, around the time when the well-known database that we that we call CRISP, uh, Center for Research in Security Prices, was was really born, which was a sort of a a, a, a follow-up of um, of data that was provided by uh, by the industry. Um, so Fama had access to this data. And was one of the first to really drill down and look at individual um, stock uh, returns and and risk and and get a sense in terms of uh, of uh, uh, was there any predictability in terms of these returns? He focused in on what uh, were in the mid 1960s the Dow Jones 30 30 stocks and looking at at various uh, various patterns and uh, looking at time series and, and correlations uh, across time, autocorrelations, 
he concluded that um, by and large stocks uh, followed a random walk, which should sound familiar going back to 1900 and Louis Bachelier. So this is where Fama then went on to coin this this notion um, of the uh, efficient markets hypothesis, which basically says that prices fully and immediately reflect all relevant information. And so this has now been synonymous with the Chicago School, um, this whole thinking that was prevalent in particular through the 60s and the, the 70s, that, that markets are efficient and test after test seem to confirm this notion of market efficiency. So let me just pause there and, and then I can continue on in the, in the story perhaps. Yeah, no, I mean, you mentioned Chicago, and of course, Chicago is, uh, you know, it features it with many of these uh, luminaries, but but actually, I think there's a little bit of a fun backstory that you might want to share, because it wasn't certain that uh, Pharma was going to get into Chicago because of the fact that they had received his application. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so Pharma had, had uh, attended uh, Tufts. Uh, uh, university um, and uh, he was applying to various schools, got accepted to various schools, but where he really wanted to go was was Chicago. And um, so he just called up the University of, of Chicago and and as it happened, the Dean of Admissions answered the phone and they got they got chatting and uh, one thing led to another and the dean of admissions said, "Well, we actually have uh, a scholarship for for Tufts uh, graduates." So, uh, which again, it would be unheard of today, uh, without actually seeing uh, Fama's um, uh, application. Fama was ex- accepted into the University of Chicago uh, PhD program, and uh, and that's how we that's how we got in. And and if not for that phone call, uh, Fama. Might have been uh, somewhere else, and not exactly. the name he is now. Yeah, no, and, and and I think these some of these coincidences are uh, are just extraordinary when you think of of what could have happened if if they didn't occur. Another thing, and I don't want to talk too much about the the person, but I do think it's he's an interesting one, and people maybe should read up on him because it's certainly a name that kind of figures in 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 my industry to some extent because it's also at Chicago that he meets Benoit Mandelbrot who was mm-hmm. this Polish French American mathematician and who told Farmer as far as I remember of this apparent randomness in uh, financial markets because he was a fan of Louis Bachelier as far as I remember as well mm-hmm. from from your book Absolutely. And, and, and this is where uh, I think Fama's dissertation and actually some of his earlier papers, uh, we talked about tail, tail risk. And there were a lot of technical articles written how um, stocks weren't perfectly, uh, weren't, uh, perfectly um, normally dis- distributed. And, and so there were these, um, there were these different models uh, that um, better captured the, the the tail risk and uh, the so-called kurtosis or or, or the peakness of, uh, of of stock returns. So a lot of I think uh, Fama's earlier studies were influenced by uh, by his conversations. Yeah, no, absolutely, and maybe also I mean you mentioned of course CRISP because they that organization also seemed to have been quite influential in bringing a lot of these people together at their semi-annual uh, events and and one individual i don't know if he specifically met him at one of these events but one of the individuals who i think we can't not mention when we talk about farmer is uh, ken french i mean again just briefly because of course a lot of the models we know today the the farmer french models they were the result of of their collaborations uh, and so a lot of people have used them since was there anything, any fun facts that you kind of remember from from that side of of, of Eugene Farmer's uh, career, the the French connection, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, that's a great great way of putting it. Um, certainly, uh, uh, Farmer has had many many co-authors, and Farmer has uh, has made many contributions through uh, his solo research. But you're absolutely right; it's it's been this this long-lasting and continuing uh, co-authorship with, with 
French and you, you, you really, and, and Ken French had done some things on his own as well, but it, it was really this, uh, this synergy between the, the, the two of them. And I think they both have a, a, a similar work ethic. And so um, they continue to, to churn out uh, research, starting with, uh, uh, we can certainly talk about it if you'd like, um, the beginnings of, of the Fama French, which were uh, uh, the Fama French model, which really ended up being a, uh, a, a critique uh, of uh, Bill Sharp's capital asset pricing model. Sure. Yeah. No. I mean, we we this we need also to leave something for the people who are going to read the book, of course. But what what I did <laughs> what I did pick up, which and I, you already alluded to already, which I think is worth mentioning at least, is what's somewhat unique about Farmer is also the fact that some of his best work, or, or, or as I think you write that three of his best pieces of work actually comes in three different decades, meaning that he has continued, which is a lot of people, as far as I understand, uh, a lot of the academics, they kind of peak early, if I could put it that way. But he's actually continued to deliver some pretty groundbreaking stuff, so to speak. And of course, he also had uh, quite a few famous uh, students, as, as far as I uh, am aware, David Booth of DFA, and of course, maybe mm-hmm. better known in my industry, Cliff Asnes of AQR. Mm-hmm. And they seem to have done pretty well from following some of his work absolutely um and and you're right that that uh it is amazing um uh, and and even uh, a lot of the nobel prize winners uh, what they're most known for is some of their early early work and fama has consistently if, if you look at some of the uh some of the most cited papers fama is uh, near the top of the list and in in so many different uh, different areas um uh, he had done a lot of early work on on corporate finance rather than investing, and and uh, and was well known for his his contributions uh, there. He had done a lot of work uh, related to economic models um, and, and looking at at interest rates and inflation in in his early years. So um, many of your listeners will know him from Fama French, but uh, he's uh, he, he's had many more contributions than that. Sure. No, absolutely. So maybe to round off uh, Eugene Farmer, if you were going to describe from, from your knowledge now what he what he would describe as the, his perfect portfolio, how, how, would you, how would you think about that? Sure. So it, it really goes back to the, the, um, the Farmer French model or the, the three-factor model. It's been expanded to five factors and who knows how many more <laughs> to come. But uh, the um, path-breaking papers uh, in 1992 and 1993 by Fama and French um, really um, ended up being captured by this, this, this notion, I think it was a New York Times article that captured the phrase that beta is, is dead. Right. Because what Fama and French found was that um, while the, the market portfolio in and of itself seemed to be correlated with uh, with stock returns. In other words, implicitly stock returns are, are driven by some kind of market factor. By adding these two other factors, one capturing the difference in returns between value and gross stocks, and the other capturing the difference between um, small stocks and large stocks, those two other factors um, dominated the um, the power of the market portfolio, uh, thus leading to this notion that that uh, the capital asset pricing model is is dead. What's surprising um, in terms of Fama's perfect portfolio, despite despite that, uh, Fama's perfect portfolio starts with a market portfolio. So Fama would say start by being diversified through an index fund, through a market portfolio, but also consistent with the Fama French model. Fama says, well, you. Once you're there, as the starting point, you may want to tilt. You may want to tilt to value stocks, which Fama and French have shown over a, a very long horizon, perhaps not uh, not in the last decade, but over a very long horizon, tend to outperform growth stocks. So tilt toward value stocks, uh, those that have low, uh, low price to book or low price earnings ratios, and also tilt toward uh, small cap uh, stocks which again uh, have done well, but uh, not necessarily over the last uh, decade. So that would be Fama's um, perfect portfolio, thinking in terms of different dimensions of, uh, of, uh, of way that we can capture risk. 
Sure. No, fantastic. Great. Now, of course, there are a lot more people that has shaped the world of finance as we know it today. And to get to know them, I would strongly suggest that all of our listeners should go, of course, and and buy your book. But I want to ask a, a couple of different things as my sort of a, a last few uh, questions before we wrap up uh, for today. And and one question is that given all of the research that you and Andrew Lowe have done to write this book, how do you view the question of what is the perfect portfolio? So we're, we're careful to say that the, the perfect portfolio, it's a moving target. And, and this is why the book's title is The Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio rather than The Perfect Portfolio per se. So it, 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 uh, it varies uh, over time and it varies uh, across individuals. And the analogy we use is um, if, if someone asks, what do I need to do to be healthy? Well, it depends on a lot of factors. It, it depends on uh, on on your particular on your particular health situation. And there are so many different uh, different uh, ways that you can take the, the the health angle through exercise, through through uh, diet, through nutrients, and and so on. But I think um, what is the perfect portfolio? There there are some common elements, and and clearly diversification is um, probably the most important element that that all of our perfect portfolios uh, should include. I think a second thing is is really having an appreciation for what our own risk appetite is. And and that's not something that's static. That that will change over time given different life uh, circumstances. But it's really being aware of uh, of, of what that uh, that risk appetite uh, uh, is, and, and I think uh, another element um, coming back to this whole notion of of cost. Whatever you're going to do, you should do it in a very cost efficient uh, manner, and and be mindful of the costs of of what you're going to be. And the final thing I would say in terms of a perfect portfolio is um, avoid what might be um, some obvious mistakes. We often uh, are overconfident in our abilities. Sometimes that can lead to excessive uh, trading. So try to be mindful of of, of all of those things. Um, and that will help you uh, along the road to this perfect portfolio. Yeah, I like how you just threw in all the behavioral stuff at the very end, because that could be a whole other conversation which uh, maybe we'll have one day. Um, but let me ask yeah. you my final question, uh, Steve. It's a, it's kind of a selfish question because uh, I come from the world of systematic trend following using a fully diversified and global portfolio of liquid futures markets that include stocks and bonds and currencies and lots of commodities where we are completely agnostic to going long or short. And um, what we can see in terms of the evidence of track records such as the firm I work for and other firms that has been around for more than 40, 50 years, it continues to work. And of course, your co-author, Andrew Lowe, has also embraced this strategy by uh, founding one of the very large players uh, in our industry today. But here's my question. We often talk about this on the podcast as being the perfect portfolio. And I'm curious how this type of approach stacks up against all the work and information you've done, considering how we approach uh, the market, so to speak. So, so I think coming back to to the premise that there isn't one perfect portfolio. Sure. What I will say is, is that let me pick up on on one element of what you've just described, um, and and that's the vastness in terms of the types of assets that you include. And and perhaps we'll end on this. Um, coming back to to Bill Sharp's mm-hmm. capital asset pricing model, he developed this, this theoretical model that talks about investing in quote unquote the market. And and what seems to have gotten lost throughout the ages is that as we operationalize and as we measure beta, the proxy for the market is a domestic uh, equity portfolio, like the S&P 500 or in, in England, the, the FTSE. So what I like about what you just described is, is that truly the, the market portfolio is all investable 
assets and even even those that aren't investable, which is pre presents right. some some challenges. So that I think what you're doing is really in the spirit of uh, of, of what we mean by the market portfolio, and and so from the sounds of things, uh, from a diversification perspective, it, it's going to be hard to um, to be more diversified than than that. So uh, so kudos for that strategy. Yeah, I think more kudos actually to the people who back in the 60s, late 60s, and certainly in the early 70s worked that out, right? Without the knowledge we have today, but they were able to work this out. I think this uh, is absolutely extraordinary, but uh, I'm so glad for that kind of seal of approval from you, Steve, that that's going to help <laughs> us a lot and give us a lot of positive uh, feedback in, in our industry for sure. But on that note, you know, we're going to wrap up uh, this very fascinating conversation, Steve. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and for sharing your thoughts and insights with me. It's been incredibly interesting to learn about how relatively few people, so to speak, had such a profound impact on the pursuit of the perfect portfolio. And to all of you listening in today, I hope that you were able to take something from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, Please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues and send us your comments. Let us know what topics you want to us to bring up in the coming conversations uh, with industry leaders in the world of finance and investing. From me, Niels Karstoblasen, thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged. In the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.